waiting to watch there. And we are now live. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the EuroWeb Book Corner. This time it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Susanna and Cecily. We'll be presenting also in, in the name of Marta, who is also a co-editor of this volume, the brand new book on textiles in ancient Mediterranean iconography. Uh, a wonderful book that, by the way, I think you will say this too, but it can be accessed on open, open, uh, open access. So that is very good. It's a very positive step towards disseminating this wonderful research that you've collected in uh, this book. I don't really think that our speakers today need a very long introduction from me. I think that everyone here and everyone that will see uh, that will see us also on YouTube will will know them very well. But I will just say some words just to introduce you. So Susanna Harris is a lecturer in archaeology at the University of Glasgow, and uh, her research is uh, focused most, I believe, on prehistoric and, and, and ancient uh, textiles, but from a host of different perspectives. I've read a lot of uh, Susanna's work on more theoretical uh, approaches to textile studies, experimental analysis, et cetera. So um, her work is very inspiring. I think we all are very familiar with it. We also have with us today, uh, Cecilie Bronze, who is a senior researcher and curator at the Nikarsberg Liptothek in Copenhagen. Uh, I think that uh, she's very well known for her research on textiles in uh, cult spaces and textiles as parts of cults in ancient Greece and in the ancient Mediterranean, but more recently also by her groundbreaking work on ancient polychromy and also the representation of uh, textiles in uh, artistic media, uh, which is uh, also the topic of this book. And I will also say, although I think Marta cannot join us today due to uh, an excess of work, but I will also say some words about the third editor of this volume, Marta Zuchowska, who is a, a, an Orientalist and a lecturer in archeology span at the University of uh, Warsaw, and who was a member of the Polish uh, expedition to Palmyra in the, in the Near East, uh, and who also has a, a quite lovely paper in this book about precisely about Palmyra and of the rich textile uh, sources uh, from Palmyra. So that is just a short introduction to say hello to our to our speakers today, to welcome them, to thank them again for uh, agreeing to join us and in this uh, edition of the Book Corner. And I will give the floor to Susanna and Cecily whenever you want to start presenting. The floor is yours. And thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. And it's lovely to see people here and connect with other EuroWeb colleagues. So hello. It's really fabulous to be part of EuroWeb, um, this big network, Europe Through Textiles, part of the cost action um, initiatives. And it's, it really is a great pleasure to present this book and the work of all our authors. There are 14 of us working together on this volume. And I think um, for me, um, really the, there's a lot been achieved in the last um, two or three decades in textile research. And I think EuroWeb is really um, an aspect of that, just to have this big project that's recognized alongside other major projects in the humanities and, and interdisciplinary um, uh, subject areas. And it's fantastic to see textiles as part of that. So first of all, it's just very nice to be presenting this volume as part of our work within this network. Now I need to, uh, I'm on the next one, okay. The volume, Textiles in Ancient Mediterranean Iconography, started as a conference session, uh, Textiles in Ancient Iconography, which was in Barcelona at the European Association of Archaeologists annual meeting. That was in 2018. And the session we organized because we wanted to bring together scholars from across many countries and the these the EAA is a wonderful opportunity to do that. And 
we are also we're interested to bring together because often people are working on their own um, in this subject area of textile iconography. They're not working in big teams like in some of the science projects. And we had an absolutely tremendous response to the call for papers. Um, we had such a massive session, we had to split it into two. Um, and this, the session lasted a whole day. And it was just really nice to be in the room with people, hearing all the new research, the discussion, meeting colleagues who are working on things of, of shared interest. Um, and the conference session included um, people working from archaeology, from classics, from anthropology, from all sorts of different countries. Um, and we decided, um, the session organisers, and we've turned into the editors of this book, we decided we wanted to edit a volume based on the session. And the cost action actually stepped in just really in time to bring this together in a really great way. So most of the authors in the volume, but not, not all of them, but most of them are part of EuroWeb. And having EuroWeb in place then so gave us the framework then to work together um, and also some funding to, to realise um, realize the volume, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so this provided, this network provided that framework to achieve this volume. And so we've really benefited from being part of the network um, and being able to, to publish this book. And what I really hope is that the volume has harness some of that energy that came from that conference session, the willingness to participate, the number of people involved and the work they were doing. And really then to reflect on the current state of research and to consider the future direction of travel. So where does it fit in in the EuroWeb um, network? This volume's part of um, working group two's contribution clothing identities gender age and status and in particular a focus area of that which is textile identities and iconography led by magdalena uh, Vozniak. will i go to the next slide it's a little bit unpredictable yep here we are book is organized chronologically and this is a timeline that we've published as part of the book um, with little uh, pictures indicating each of the different chapters and their content. So you can see the timeline here, it's stretching from the Bronze Age to late uh, Roman times, so covering from the second millennium BC to the first millennium um, of the Common Era. And actually constructing this timeline is itself a really fascinating um, aspect of the research. So early on, we have um, the early parts in the Bronze Age. There's uh, Agata Ulanovska's work on uh, the seals um, and also um, Raquel uh, Pierini's work on uh, the log teller logograms. So we have the iconography in these earlier periods in this context of the writing and communicating in a very direct way. As we move then into through the centuries, there's a particular cluster from the sixth to fourth um, century BCE. And this is another really fascinating sort of chronological cluster here, I think, because this is the time when early towns, early cities are becoming important um, in the, particularly in the um, Eastern Mediterranean. And actually iconography is a really significant part of that coming together of people in towns. And so there is some really important iconography, important research in that area. So we have quite a lot of people working um, with this. And towards the later period, actually iconography becomes really significant in um, architecture, monumental architecture, and a number of uh, colleagues. Uh, um, Sicily is going to talk through all the chapters, so I won't mention too much of those, but in the Roman period, you know, the iconography, these sculptures, um, part of important buildings. So chapter 10, the, the frieze at the bottom, the frieze of, of weaving is from the 
Forum Transitorium in Rome. This is work by uh, Magdalena Orman. Um, and, and so actually putting together that timeline does also help think about the significance of iconography in the way people are communicating, representing themselves, and that's part of society. So we've thought about the book chronologically. This is now thinking of the geographical uh, spread of the book and working with uh, Neil Erskine, who helped me put together the timeline. We also put together this map. And this was also very exciting, actually, going through each chapter and picking out the places that people were referring to, where the artifacts come from, where, where, uh, where the work is based, um, pulling that together to make the map. Uh, and then making it actually just gave a great idea of the spread of, um, of places that uh, are mentioned and discussed in the volume. There's a big focus on uh, Greece and um, Western Turkey, um, but we have a spread throughout the Mediterranean, you know, it's from the, from the West, Spain, Tunisia to the East, uh, Jordan, Syria, um, Iraq, and so, you know, I think, I think this is very nice for thinking about that Mediterranean, that Middle Sea, the connections, and of course, the influences between people in those areas, um, making this iconography. These are big, bold statements that people made and um, then influenced one another. And ideas were very directly taken from one place to another. So, for example, in the, um, the paper of... Um, uh, paper on the, the mosaics of Carthage, but these are Roman mosaics, they have their own local style, but they're, 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 they're rooted in the styles of the later Roman, period, Roman Empire and its huge expanse there. So I'll pass over now to Cecilia. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah, I'll pick it up from here. And I will just tell a little bit about each of the chapters in our book to give you an idea of the, the scope to supplement what uh, Susanna just told. Well, briefly, we have a we start with an introduction written by uh, Susanna and myself, which addresses the various challenges and mythological methodological aspects of dealing with textiles in ancient iconography. But I will also get back to that a little bit later about some of the key points. So the first, well, the second paper is by Agata Ulanovska, Textile Production in Aegean Glyptic, Interpreting Small-Scale Representations on Seals and Ceilings from Bronze Age Greece. And this paper explores textile production-related iconography on seals from Bronze Age Greece. 13 motifs related to textile production are recognized in the imagery. These range from the flax plant uh, and the woolly animals to fiber combing, purple dyeing, spinning and weaving using loom weights and perhaps the comb and the rigid heddle to finish textiles and bands. And all these processes and tools are symbolically interwoven in the figure of the spider, a frequent motif in the Aegean glyptic. Ulanovska proposes a new motif, uh, she proposes new motif identifications, which suggests that textile production and the material culture related to it constituted an important semantic reference reflected in the imagery of seals, especially on Crete in the Middle Bronze Age. And the third paper by Rachele Pierini, Textiles and Iconography in the Bronze Age, Aegean Scripts, the Tela Logogram and the Ligatured Endogram T. And this paper explores the iconography of ancient textiles using, using a paleographic analysis of the logogram tela to represent textiles in the Bronze Age in Gian scripts of the second millennium BCE. It also investigates the earliest iconographic examples of writing practice, given that the boundaries between art and scripts are blurred during this period. And such an approach is particularly fruitful when applied to as yet undeciphered scripts such as the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, since it allows some access to text that cannot yet be read. And this paper takes Tela and T as a case study, and its analysis uses, uh, used as evidence. The loan words on Knossos textiles terminology, 
the influence of linear A scribal practices on the linear B evidence from Knossos, and the paleographic similarities between linear A texts from the north coast of Crete and the earliest known evidence of linear B. The fourth paper by Thaddeus Nelson is entitled Loom or Lear, a dual reading of iconography from the Iron Age II site of Kuntilid Eichrud. And this paper deals with images from Iron Age Eichrud from the 8th century BCE, Tel Batash and Ashtat, 11th to 10th century BCE, showing related figures holding strong frames, which have been identified as lyres, the musical instruments. However, several technical features of the frames, according to Thaddeus Nelson, suggest that they could not have been uh, musical, um, that they could not have been lyres, but also musical instruments, sorry. So this paper explores similarities between these images and strong frames found on 5th century BCE Greek and 7th century BCE Hellstatt ceramics and suggests that the Levantine iconography shows a textile process called sprang. If the Levantine images do show textile production rather than music, this will provide a new direction for research into the techniques used during the Iron Age. However, the constraints of the stylized painting and simplified carvings prevent a, defi a fi definitive identification of these frames as lias or looms. And this ambiguity provides an opportunity to reflect on the impact of these tools on our Iron Age perspectives. The fifth paper is by our own Susanna Harris, entitled Abundance and Splendor, Textiles and Archaic Greek Statues of Young Women, the so-called Kurai. Susanna's paper addresses the statues of young women in 6th century BCE Greece, which are remarkable for their elaborate textile clothing. In her paper, she identifies the type, number and quality of textiles represented as garments on these famous statues. And it considers the history of research and assesses the textiles and statues in the light of the archaeological evidence, which demonstrate the quality and quantity of textiles worn in these outfits and lead to a wider discussion of the significance of these abundant and splendid materials. The next paper is by Daphne D. Martin. It's entitled The Color of Cult, Artemis Praurunia and the Corcutus. And her paper explores the way ways in which color, specifically the saffron yellow textile known as the Kokutas, which was an integral to the cult of Artemis Praurunia, Praurunia both at her sanctuary in uh, Brauron and an, on the Athenian Acropolis. It highlights the links between Artemis Praurunia, Athenian girls, femininity, and saffron textiles. And it does so through a close examination of the Brauron clothing catalogues, visual evidence of textile dedication, from Bauern and Vincent Brinkmann's, Vincent Brinkmann's color reconstruction of the Peplos core. And by revealing the intimate associations between Artemis Praurunia and the rich saffron textiles donned, dedica dedicated, displayed and depicted at her sanctuary sites, it seeks to provide broader insights into the significance and symbolism of color in the dynamic religious landscape of ancient Greece. This is followed by the paper by Dimitra Andreanu, uh, entitled Furniture Textiles in Classical and Hellenistic Iconography. And her paper addresses the various types of textile furnishings by investigating the excavated evidence and particularly the visual representations of furniture on vase and wall paintings and reliefs of the classical and Hellenistic periods in Greece and Italy. This includes pillows, sheets and mattresses on bed couches and pillows on footstools, which signify the need for comfort. And textiles were also used instead of architecture to denote the separation of spaces and as cloth canopies or, or baldekins. And then the paper by Ricardo uh, E. Basso Real is entitled Ideology, Gender and Textile Production, the Iconography of Women in the Iberian Culture. Images of the women related to the textile activities of the Iberian culture have been interpreted as rites of passage, as depictions of everyday activities or status symbols of powerful women. This paper proposes that their meaning can only be interpreted with reference to the important process of the intensification of household textile production, which takes place from the Middle Iberian period. 
Archaeological evidence demonstrates that the textile tools in settlements and burials increases considerably at this time, and classical sources emphasize the social significance of Iberian textile production and its importance in the Mediterranean trade. Using these data, and as an analysis of these images, this paper proposes that their significance reaches beyond their symbolism to the ideology of an elite with important interests in textile products and their increased production. And then the next paper is written by myself, and it's entitled All That Glitters is Gold, Golden Textiles in the Ancient Mediterranean. And in this paper, I investigate the various evidence for golden textiles, starting out with iconography, the use of gilding for the polychromy um, of various uh, statues from terracotta figurines to marble statues uh, from the Roman period, for example, and then comparing it to what we know and what we have of evidence from the archaeological record and written sources to thus illustrate that these were actually quite widespread and often depicted in ancient art and iconography. And this is followed, my paper is followed by Magdalena Oermann, uh, who has written a paper entitled Arachne Revisited, Hybris and Technology in the Forum Transitorium Frieze in Rome. And Magdalena's paper addresses the weaving context between Minerva and Arachne, as described in Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis, which is depicted in the friezes in the Forum Transitorium in Rome. The interpretation of the mythological motif and its combination with scenes of textile production is still debated. Through analysis of the Arachne episode in the Astronomica of Manilius, this paper shifts the focus from Arachne to Minerva as patron goddess of craft and addresses the purpose of repetitive features in the frieze panels depicting cloth preparation. Her paper argues that the motif of virtuous textile work offers an imperial response to an emerging stoic paradigm of auxorial loyalty, while simultaneously showcasing the economic value of strongly gendered traditional textile work in and beyond the elite. The repeated display of a loom type, rarely parallel at the time, creates a pronounced focus on the potential economic output of female industriousness, expertise and technological development. Chapter 11 is written by Kelly Olson and entitled Fringe Clothing in Roman Iconography and Written Sources. This paper examines the depiction and function of fringes in Latin literature and Roman art with a short survey of fringes in the ancient Greek, Near Eastern and Jewish societies. And it argues that fringe may have functioned in an apotropaic manner, just as Bill said. This hypothesis is strengthened by the fact that fringe was not a fashion item in Roman antiquity, but usually used to decorate ritual garments. And chapter 12 is written by our co-editor, Marta Sukowska, entitled Between Realism and Artistic Convention, Woolen Mantles in the Iconography of Roman Palmyra. And as you probably know, Palmyra is one of the rare archaeological sites dated to the Roman period where abundant organic materials have survived, including a large group of preserved textiles. Archaeological research in Palmyra has also brought to light numerous contemporary representations, mostly funerary sculpture, but also some wall paintings, which illustrate a wide spectrum of the clothing and fabrics worn by the Panamarines. Some of the most commonly represented, represented items of clothing on the sculptures are woolen mantles, which are chosen as a case study in this paper, for thus to assess the extent to which the artistic vision of the Palmarine sculptors corresponds to reality. Chapter 13, written by Amy Place, uh, and her paper is entitled Reading Dress and Identity in the Roman Mosaics of Carthage and Tabaka. Amy's paper examines the iconography in two mosaics, the Dom Dominus Julius mosaic from Carthage and a Villa Rustica mosaic from Tabaka in Tunisia, and explores the methodological issues of extrapolating Roman dress practice from mosaics. Depictions of dress in mosaic floors can be understood as a form of represented clothing, a form that documents dominant societal ideas and ideals that have been transformed into the visual medium, medium to become image clothing. 
Reading dress from mosaic imagery thus requires an appreciation of how visual imagery was intended to be viewed. And according to Amy, it was uh, most significantly a version of lived dress practice manipulated to reflect contemporary visual conventions. And all these cha chapters are rounded off by our dear friend and colleague, Mary Harlow, who wrote a really, really good uh, epilogue to the book, just summing up some of the main themes addressed in this book. Because as you can tell from this brief uh, survey of our chapters, uh, it spans very broad period uh, of time and also geographically, as also Susanna mentioned. So that was very nice of Mary. And then finally, we also did a glossary, which I would like to mention here as well, because hopefully it might be used to many of you, or some of you at least. We did a glossary of all the text uh, terms mentioned in these chapters with English translations or explanations with the help uh, from uh, the always excellent uh, Peter uh, Flinister. So, so yeah, that was a, an overview of the, the book and the contributions in the book. And I will just turn to a few uh, yeah, key points. Thank you, Susanna. Um, just to yeah, round up a little bit what we dealt with here. As you all know, there are only very few, well, textiles are very rarely preserved in archeological record. And that's also what really inspired us to work from this point of view, focusing on iconography as a source um, material to our knowledge of ancient dress and textiles. And our, in our opinion, iconography is in fact our most accessible way of looking at textiles and dress of the past based on this uh, lack of material evidence of uh, real textiles from the archeological record. And we also argue for a textile approach where we put textiles or the representation of them in the forefront of any interpretation, like trying to use textiles to think with and to use the textiles yeah, as a, a point of departure in studies of antiquity. And one thing that was also quite evident from this book is the case of cross-disciplinarity uh, and the um, the advantages of cross-disciplinarity when studying ancient textiles and dress. And here I can, for example, come with the example of my own research, how helpful it has been to have knowledge of ancient textiles and combine it with what we know and discover from ancient polygamy, for example, and how we also use this knowledge of textiles to reconstruct ancient um, artifacts. But that goes in, in different ways and it's also like, exemplified by Magdalena Orman with her um, study, which includes experimental archaeology, for example, in the, her study of the Forum Transitorium Free. So I think that's pretty general for many of the papers in our book. This is really the um, cross-disciplinarity. And as has also been said before, we cannot all be experts in everything, but by taking in other disciplines as well and take them into consideration, I think we can get much further in our study in ancient textiles of and dress. Oh, and again here, the color, which is transformative of our understanding of the visual culture of the past. And I think many papers also address this question. That's, for example, also Susanna Harris and Daphne as well as my own paper, but also um, Ricardo Basso-Royal's paper, how colors, of course, needs to be taken into consideration and their significance when looking at these iconographical depictions. What do the colors actually mean and how can we even detect them? Um, and then the iconographical written and archaeological sources do all, not always match. That's another learning point from the book. Uh, and then what do we do then? And then we, of course, need a solid methodology, methodological approach uh, when combining these sources. And I think, but in my opinion, that's also what makes it interesting and really fun that of course it doesn't always line up. And what does this actually mean? Uh, when one thing is shown in iconography and something else seems to be evident from the written sources, for example, and how do we combine written sources and iconography? That is really challenging, often like deciphering what is what in depictions, or again, taking the other point of view, what is actually written in, about in the written sources. Yeah. Yeah, and that also 
brings to mind the fluid relationship between the representations in these um, in art and reality. How were real textiles worn? What did they look like? How were they draped? What kind of garment types? Who wore them? And what is actually represented in art? Um, and that's, of course, also something that needs to be taken into consideration. But again, that does not mean we should give up on iconography on the, on the contrary. Well, this is, uh, yeah, again, textiles in the center of society and essential and ubiquitous. Um, sorry, that's a tricky word. I don't know why I even wrote that down. I should have avoided it. <laughs> it's so hard to pronounce. Sorry. Yeah. Well, but again, it's kind of... Uh, a little bit repetitive of what I said about using textiles to think with, use it as our point of departure in studies of the past of ancient societies. Um, but of course also adopt an, a critical awareness of the relationship between evidence, cultural context and interpretation, which is necessary when uh, performing studies like this, for example. Of course, I also, in the end, need to address the challenges a little bit, which is uh, one thing we wrote about also in our introduction, Susanna and I, which is uh, really problematic, which is the access to artifacts or high resolution color images, uh, images of them, which is really difficult. And I think the pandemic has also made this even more, um, I don't know, evident to most of us that now we cannot just travel everywhere. And this is also very bad for environment. So it can be tricky to get access to artifacts. And maybe some things are not even on display uh, or maybe it's not even possible to get these very good high resolution color images. Sometimes they don't even exist. I work in a museum myself. We have a huge collection of ancient art and they're not always Photograph. It's not like we don't want to share them, we just don't have them. And of course, that really limits, um, to some extent, the kind of research that can be carried out regarding iconography. And it also creates a certain bias because it means, it means that we often use many of the same cases because those are the ones that are published or we can get access to. And then, of course, what uh, both Mary writes in her epilogue and Susanna and I also um, I agree in our introduction is that there's still a persistent questioning of the reliability and relevance of textiles, which should not be the case. And hopefully we have shown that with this book and these wonderful papers by all these amazing authors who have done a really great job, I think, in um, yeah, publishing their research in this field. And we're very grateful for that. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes, this is very important, actually, me talking more and more, but this is very maybe the most important slide, because here's a link to find the book. It's uh, published as a hardback by Oxbow Books, but it's also available as an ebook for free. Uh, and again, this hopefully helps this bias, as we talked about, that everybody can get access to this publication for free, no matter where you are in the world, if there's a pandemic or not, or whatever. So you can just go to this link and you can read the book for free. So, and thank you for cost for financing uh, the funding of this. And then finally, of course, we would like to thank our funders, most of, first of all, COST Network, of course, but also the Center for Research on Ancient Civilizations, the British Academy, Academy and the University of Glasgow. And of course, all our amazing authors who did such a great job and were super patient <laughs> with us as editors. So yeah, thank you. I think this is more or less what I plan to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thank you so much, Cecily, for this wonderful presentation. It really gives a very nice um, overview of the book. And I think that anyone that hasn't read it already will immediately order it or access it on open access and look through it. Uh, I can only say that on my part, I was, I was really impressed about the scope of the book, both the chronological and the geographic scope. Portugal isn't there, but it will be. <laughs> I will, we will join this this. Uh, this discussion, we don't have as many data as on as other areas in the Mediterranean, uh, but we will join this discussion for sure. Um, and also, I think mm, I just would like to say that for me, beyond being a great read and something that is very interesting and very uh, nice to read, it is also I think it will also prove to be a, a wonderful working tool 
not just because of the glossary, which uh, Cecily mentioned, which, which will be su super useful, but, but also because it um, gathers so much insights on how to, on the methodology and the theoret theoretical principles that we can deploy to overcome the um, issues that studying iconography raises. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot. We don't have that much iconography for the period and the area that I study, but I've been thinking ab about that a lot and how to study that and how to um, weave that into the whole discussion about textiles and dress. And I found so much useful insights in this, in this book. So I really thank you for that. But I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So I will now open the floor. And if anyone has any questions, any comments they would like to do to our editors and to our speakers today, please go ahead. I will check on YouTube in the meantime. No questions on YouTube. So if anyone on Zoom wants to intervene now. Not at the moment. Oh, yes. Uh, Lena, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the publication, of course, uh, and for having it on open access, which is really generous. Uh, are you planning to have uh, any kind of follow up conference or something like that? Um. Not, we haven't got plans for a direct follow-up conference, but I'm very much hoping that our authors will continue working together. And I think working on these volumes, you plant seeds for new projects. And so I, I hope that there are some openings there. Um, but I think actually this idea of follow-up is, um, is actually a really, good question, even if there's not something directly from here. Possibly one of the things that most motivated me in this area was a few years ago when I came to my position at Glasgow, I wanted to collaborate with a colleague on a project and look at some of the iconography in the area she was working with. So I suggested that as a um, as a line of evidence alongside, you know, the paleo environmental evidence and ceramics and things like this. And actually in the interview for the funding, they were very rude about using the iconography and it's possibly, you know, one of the reasons she didn't get the funding. Okay. And I think this is really serious because it's a hugely important line of evidence. And if funders are not believing in it or, you know, not just dismissing it, then, this is a real hurdle. So this was one of the um, things that inspired me to edit the volume. And so while there might not be a direct volume two out there, <laughs> I hope there will be, I hope this will maybe form the basis of a number of other um, projects that move on. But maybe you have your own ideas, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I think that would be, I mean, it's, it's, um, as you say, uh, a field which is still, it's so rich, but it's still quite unexplored. So there is much more to do. So it's, it's just to plunge in, I think, and show the, the importance of imagery, um, which, as you said, it's, it's the best evidence we have for, in many ways for textiles. I agree, Lena. I completely agree. But as okay. Susanna said, we don't have any specific plans as it is, but okay. you're completely right. That it's not like now it's done. We, we did a book <laughs> and now <laughs> we don't it. have to discuss this more. <laughs> no, I completely agree. There, there is material enough for, for several books, actually. I would yeah. Say. Okay. Yeah. So it's let's a good see. idea. Thank you. Well, and the book just came out a couple of months ago or three months ago or something like that. So it's still. Probably people are still working through it, but it, I'm mm. sure it will inspire more research uh, in the future. And uh, I was mentioning Portugal. We do not have as many sources, but there are other areas around the Mediterranean. Well, this, these areas that are studied here, of course, there is a lot more material to and a lot more issues to address. But there are other areas, for example, where I uh, that are not represented in this book, certainly because there was no one at the time working on it. Uh, but for example, I've just came back from France from a conference on, on Iron Age art in France, and they have so much 
material um, and so much iconography with, with really interesting representations of textiles and dress in, in Southern France and in Iron Age context of Southern France. So that is a, a, an area that, that uh, could probably be inspired by, by the work that you compiled in this book. And even Spain, there is a lot more. Ricardo's contribution is amazing, of course, but there is much more to do also in Southern Spain, in Portugal. And I definitely think that it is material and uh, openings for more. And the, this book will only foster that. I'm pretty sure it will only stimulate people to, to think about it and to, to work about it more. Yeah. Any more questions, any more comments from our audience? I think those who read the book are already very impressed and <laughs> convinced that you're absolutely and those who haven't are now just typing away to, to buy the book somehow somewhere. Else. Yeah. Well, okay. It's it's always of course very nice to hear from other people about their research and how you know questions they might have about particular parts of the, the book. It's good to hear from people too about how they might be taking things forward and what they're doing so you know, the conversations both ways <laughs> always yeah, exactly yes absolutely any more questions any more comments if not i think that i will just thank our our speakers for the for taking the time to be with us today and for presenting their wonderful book to recommend everyone again who hasn't read it to go find it online or to go buy it because it is really a wonderful addition to uh, literature on, on ancient textiles and uh, to a topic that is really that really has a lot of uh, room for growth in the future and this all this growth will be for sure inspired and, uh, and based on, on the work compiled in this volume. So Susanna and Cecily, thank you so much for joining us in this new edition of the Your Web Book Corner. It was a pleasure to hear from you and to hear about your book. Yeah. And I hope to see you all soon. The Your Web Book Corner will now have, take a summer break. We won't be doing any book mm -hmm. corners during the summer, but we hope in September or October to be back with new, new editions. There are more books that have just come out. There are books that are uh, coming out during the summer. So hopefully we will meet again very soon to talk another about another uh, editorial project like this one so thank you very much for joining thank us today you. yeah thank you all for listening and thank you francisco for arranging this thank you so much it was my